everybody, Boot, let's all stand. 510, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling you, may all the darkness depart. Before I say anything else, if you need an answer sheet, does anybody need an answer sheet? All right. I'm going to give them Mr. Billy. And if it, well, if anybody needs one, just uh, raise your hand, that kind of thing, and he'll bring you one just as a reminder. We started last Wednesday night having some fun with the Christmas story. We looked at a lot of prophecies uh, last week and saw how they were answered in the New Testament. And this week, pretty much, we'll, we'll be with the Christmas story in the New Testament. And just hold on to your answer sheet, because next week, at the end of our fun time together, we're going to see who answered the most correct, and you're going to get a really nice prize. I'm going to bring you a beautiful Christmas present, and you don't want to miss it. So we'll do that next week. You can't wait, can you? All right. Um, one quick announcement I've been asked to make is uh, there's a key box over at the FLC building, and the key is missing from the key box. So you know what? He's making a list and checking it twice. Going to find out who's naughty or nice. Now, if you've got that key and you don't return it, you're going to be on the naughty list. No, I'm just teasing. Um, but if, 
if you happen to go into the FLC, took the key and didn't remember to put it back in the box, if you would, um, you know, sneak here under the cloak of darkness while nobody else is looking <laughs> and make your way to the box and open it up and put it in there, you'll be no worse for the wear, right? Nobody will ever know. <laughs> but yes, sure enough, that, that key needs to be returned if you have it. Um, we want to, to go back to what we had been doing. We didn't do it last week. Of course, we spent the whole night, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, sharing testimonies. But I think it's a good thing on a Wednesday night, which is primarily prayer meeting, it's good for us to come together and talk about how God has worked in our lives and how we've seen answers to prayers, or maybe just God show out and do something spectacular in our lives that, that we didn't even pray about, but God just did it. So if you've got a quick testimony tonight, we sure would love to hear that before we get started with other things. Marilyn? Um, well, That's a good thing. Yeah, she gave her, I don't know if you heard that, but she gave her final in her class today and all 40 passed. Which tells me some good things about the way she teaches, right? That's a good thing. I think a, a professor ought to want their students to pass. You know, and you ought to teach in such a way and even test in such a way that they have a good opportunity to do that if they've done what they're supposed to do. So that's good news. Amen. Who else? Josh? All right. So the boy coming to the family. That's, that's awesome. Praise the Lord with you and for you on that. Anyone else? That's a wonderful testimony to the grace of God in your life. Anybody else? It's beautiful when God works through others. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to thank the Lord for saving my soul. Amen. And I know that uh, that Thank you for sharing that tonight. I think we all can testify in harmony with that one, can't we? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Hmm. Amen. Who else? Yes. I found out that uh, both my Marines are going to be home for Christmas, so all my babies will be here. All right. That's good for you. Amen. Anyone else? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and 
as a body thank the Lord for His many blessings. I thought about what Amanda said there. Thankful for the people that God puts in our lives and the things that we have because of, of good people, whether they're the medical community or family members or good neighbors. How many of you have a good neighbor? Yeah, we have really good neighbors, and I'm thankful for them. Uh, you know, when you drive down a country road and you see a turtle on a fence post, he did not get there by himself, <laughs> right? And so, absolutely, you can say something. Else. Thank you so much, Amanda. But we're thankful for the people that God puts in our lives, right? And so much of God's grace is displayed through what He does through others. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll jump into our content tonight. Lord, thank you for the beautiful day that we've had. It's been a beautiful day because you have been with us in your spirit uh, is that abiding presence in our lives who gives us comfort, who gives us strength, who empowers us to do the things you've called on us to do. And so, Lord, we're thankful for that. God, how good it is on a Wednesday night in the middle of the week to come in together and hear praise reports and see how you've been working in lives, prayers you've answered, Lord, the gifts you've given us uh, because of the people around us, your goodness, Lord, is all around us, and we just want to say thank you tonight. Father, what we're about to do is good, as we are reminded of the greatest story ever, and that's how you intersected our lives by coming down and taking upon yourself flesh and walking among us and showing us your glory and teaching as no one else had ever taught and then ultimately going to the cross and dying for our sins. And so, Father, tonight we just bow our heads and humble our hearts to you and we say, Lord, thank you for who you are, for what you're doing right now and what you've promised to do. We pray all of that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and amen. So those of you that were here last Wednesday night, you know how this works. I'm going to ask you a question. I'll give you just a moment or two to process the question and, and write down your answer, and then I'll reveal the answer uh, when everybody looks back up at me, and we'll have some dialogue about each one of these. And there's a particular one at the end that I want to come back to and we'll wade a little deeper into one of the subjects that will come up tonight. So question number one, and of course this is that middle column on your sheet. Which angel did God send to tell Mary she would bear Jesus? Which angel was it? Pretty easy question because you hear that in a lot of the Christmas songs and that kind of thing. And then furthermore, there aren't many angels in the Bible who are mentioned by name. Just a very few. One of them's the ultimate wicked angel, the fallen angel. So you know it's not him. <laughs> so it boils down to really just a couple of options. So who was that angel? that God sent to tell Mary that Jesus would be born through her. Looks like everybody's looking my direction. That angel was? Somebody be loud and proud. There you go. <laughs> I hear whispering and that kind of thing. Gabriel, maybe Gabriel. It was indeed Gabriel, uh, the New Testament, in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 and the sixth month, Scripture says, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a virgin betrothed 
to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. So Gabriel, at different times throughout Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, he's the minister of announcements. You'll see Gabriel come onto the scenes when God needs to send a direct message to people who need to hear it. And what a beautiful direct message that was. Mary was becoming with child. And Gabriel comes to her and explains it all. All right. Easy one. Number two. In which Galilean town did Mary and Joseph live? Of course, in the previous text, it talks about them being betrothed. So they were about to be married. They weren't married yet. But where did they meet? Where did they grow up? Where were they when the Lord sent Jesus into the womb of Mary? That's an easy one. Somebody call it out loud. I heard it. Say it loud. (coughs) Nazareth. That's right. These aren't trick questions. Now, we might get to a trick question uh, or a couple of them here in a few moments, and they're really not trick. It just makes you think, but that's an easy one. That's where they were. I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago when we looked at the Micah 5.2 passage, that when you think about the life of Christ, you think about some important locations in ancient Israel, of course, the birth. You do think about Bethlehem because that's where he was born. We'll talk a little more about that in a moment. And then you think about Nazareth because that's where he grew up. And by the way, about how long did Jesus live in Nazareth? Any idea? Yeah, almost 30 years would be just a little less than 30 years because remember, he spent time in Bethlehem. So when they went there and he was born in Bethlehem, it would be nearly two years later when the wise men would come And then Herod gets involved because the wise men are looking for this one who has been born king of the Jews. And Joseph, again, is warned in a dream to take Jesus and Mary and go where? To Egypt. And then ultimately they come back out of Egypt and go to Nazareth. So probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 27 to 28 years, Jesus would have lived in Nazareth. And then, of course, back to what I was saying, the third town that for most people comes quickly to mind is Jerusalem because, you know, that's where he was crucified and buried and ultimately rose again. But there is another town. This is just an aside. doesn't have really anything to do with the Christmas narrative in the New Testament. But there's another really, really significant town to the life and ministry of Jesus. Does anyone have any idea what town that would be? Well, Galilee, it is, this town is in Galilee. And so Galilee's a region. So Nazareth is also in Galilee. Uh, Tiberias is in Galilee. But there's another Galilean town that factored significantly into the life and ministry of Christ. Bethany? Nope, but Bethany's important. Let's just talk. Oh, I heard. Josh, did you say Capernaum? You're exactly right. Let's talk about Bethany. Why is Bethany important when you think about the life and ministry of Jesus? Yeah, so his good friends, Lazarus and the two sisters, Martha and Mary, were at Bethany. They seemed to be supporters of the ministry of Christ, and particularly toward the end of his life, you see him in the Passion Week, moving from Bethany back over to Jerusalem nearly on a daily basis from the day of his triumphant entry until the day of his arrest and ultimate crucifixion 
and all of those things. But yeah, Bethany factors in there because some amazing things happened there. Number one, when you think about Bethany, what happened to Lazarus in the town of Bethany? He was raised from the dead in Bethany. That's right. Um, what, what was another significant event? Can you think of it? It has to do again with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. It's where Jesus was anointed. Yeah, the alabaster box, and Mary would take that and break it and uh, anoint the Lord Jesus. And then one more thing, one really, really huge thing happened in Bethany. Any idea? What about the ascension? Yeah, so Bethany is over on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. If you're at the peak of the Mount of Olives and you're looking west, you're looking straight into Old City Jerusalem. So if you ever see that iconic picture of Old City Jerusalem with the Dome of the Rock, you know, the Golden Dome there, and you see the wall of the city and the eastern gate, you know, that is looking toward Jerusalem from the peak of the Mount of Olives. But if you were to turn your back and look over the other direction toward the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, that's Bethany. So no wonder you would say Bethany because it does factor prominently into the story of Jesus. But Capernaum was the other one that, that I would mention. So for me, when I think of significant towns to the life and ministry of Christ, I think of Bethlehem birth, I think of Nazareth growing up, I think of Capernaum because his three years of earthly public ministry, Jesus centered himself out of Capernaum. So that's where he, he lived for the bulk of those three years of ministry before he came to Jerusalem that last few days of his life. So Capernaum, I may just have to give my prize to Josh next week. What do you think? No, he, he's got to do more than that. You got to impress me more, but that is good. C Capernaum is huge. We can talk about so many things when we think about the life of Christ. But back to our answer, uh, of course we know it was Nazareth because the Bible says in Luke 1, 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And that's where Gabriel spoke to Mary and that's where Joseph also lived. That's where he was a carpenter. That's where they would ultimately come back to before Christ started his public ministry. So yes, Nazareth. Number three, who was, and I left my apostrophe S off of this, but who was Mary's cousin with whom she stayed three months after Gabriel visited her? Who was Mary's cousin with whom she stayed three months after that announcement from Gabriel? Yes, Amanda. You're giving the answer. Everybody heard. That's fine. No, you're fine. You're fine. That's, that's great. I love that. No, you're good. You're good. I love it. I like the eagerness. <laughs> I love it. So, so the answer is Elizabeth. Elizabeth was an older cousin of Mary's. Who was Elizabeth's husband? Who? No. That's a, that's a good guess. Does anybody know who her husband was? Yeah, I'm hearing it. Zechariah, not to be confused with the prophet, Zechariah from the Old Testament, but Elizabeth's husband was Zechariah, and Scripture tells us back in Luke 1, 39 and 40, Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste 
to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, again, her older cousin, and she had spent that first trimester of her pregnancy there in the home of Elizabeth. How did, this is staying with the Zechariah and Elizabeth story, and this gets us to what Amanda was saying a moment ago. How did the unborn John the Baptist respond to the news of Jesus' coming? So, here's the story. Mary gets the news from Gabriel. She goes down to the hill country and spends time with Elizabeth, and when she comes in, Elizabeth too is expecting a child, and her child would be Amen. John the Baptist. You said <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Bible scholar over here. She's giving the free answers. So no, oh, you're good, girl. You're good. You're good. You're good. Elizabeth is pregnant. Mary comes, and there's a response by John the Baptist. And how did the unborn John the Baptist respond? That's right. The Bible says that he leaped or leapt, however you want to make that a verb. He leaped within the womb. Scripture says, in that same chapter, Luke 1, For indeed, as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Um, I saw a social media post two or three years ago that I, I can't forget. It was about this, and it has to do with the, the thought of an unborn child and uh, the, the life that is in an unborn child. And the post simply said to always remember the first person to get excited about the news of Christ's coming was an unborn child. It's pretty good, isn't it? So the news of Jesus coming through Mary it excited John the Baptist, and he leaped within his mother's womb. Which angel did God send to Joseph? So we've got two at, at play here. You know, Mary, she received the announcement by an angel. So which angel did God send to Joseph to talk to him about Mary's pregnancy? Which angel? Don't be looking in your Bibles. That's cheating. We'll look at the Bible later, but which angel did God send to Joseph? He sent an angel to Mary. Which one did he send to Joseph? All right. Have you marked it down? Everybody recorded an answer? <laughs> uh, the Bible scholar can't help you on this one. She's all out of answers here. Who wants to take it on? Somebody want to call out an answer? Somebody said, Gabriel, what if I told you this? We don't know. I, I told you we were going to get into some tricks here, but it's not a tricky question. It's just the honest truth because here's what the Bible says in Matthew 1.20. When you begin to get the narrative about Joseph, it's not in Luke. You've got to go over to Matthew the Bible says, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And that angel, I'm sorry, is unidentified. So, Amanda, that's why you didn't know. <laughs> so, actually, she had the right answer, didn't she? She had the right answer. So that's one we, we don't know because that particular angel is not identified. But let me ask you something else. Was that angel a male or a female? Male or female. 
There you go, Lori. Smarty pants over there. That's right. Uh, their angels are asexual. They're neither male nor female. I know that Scripture uses male names uh, like Lucifer, like Gabriel, like Michael, you know, those archangels whose names we know. But um, they, they are non-gender. They're created. Angels are, are beasts. They're, they're created. Uh, they have volition. They have will because, you know, Lucifer exercised his will and the fallen angels that fell with Satan, they exercised their will. Um, but uh, they're, they're not human. They don't have human qualities. They were not created in the image of God like you and I are. And so, you know, they, they do very specific things. They're powerful, no doubt about it, but they do the very specific things that God designed them to do. All right. What did the angel tell Joseph to name the Messiah? What did angel tell Joseph to name the baby boy that would be delivered? All right, I still see heads down and fingers moving, so. I'll tell you this, he told Joseph to name him something, and then he also said that people would call him something. All right, we ready? This is an easy one. He said to name him Jesus, and that he would be also called Emmanuel. And we talked about that last week. That comes from the Old Testament. Emmanuel meaning what? God with us, but he was told to name him Jesus. This is the one we're going to come back to uh, to conclude our time together tonight. Matthew 1, 21, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. If you continue to read there, Matthew 1, the angel also tells Joseph that people will acknowledge him as Emmanuel. Which Caesar required a registration of all the world? World in quotation, because obviously all the world hadn't been discovered quite yet. And the world that Scripture is talking about there is the Roman world, the Roman occupied world, which was a big chunk of the Eastern Hemisphere. But which Caesar was it? You know that. It's in the Luke story. You hear it every year. All right. It was Caesar who? Caesar Augustus. That's right. Scripture says in Luke 2, 1, we're going back to Luke now, to chapter 2, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be registered. Um, someone else was in that same conversation, uh, another political figure that was um, stated by Luke as being the governor of Syria. Do you remember who that is? That's not a, one of our questions tonight. Quirinius. So Caesar Augustus was the Roman emperor. Quirinius was the governor, Luke says, of Syria. It would be that whole Middle Eastern section uh, adjacent to the shore of the Mediterranean going up to Syria and Lebanon, coming on down through Israel and into that little corner of Egypt and Africa there. But... Quirinius would later be replaced by another governor that would govern that area. He would take direction from Caesar and he would be in control of that area. Do you remember who that was? Pilate. So Quirinius, governor at the time Jesus was born, Pilate becomes the governor at the time Jesus was crucified. 
but Augustus was the Roman Caesar during the birth of Christ. Why did Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem for the registration? Some translations call it a taxation. It had to do with taxation, but it was really a census, a registration. The Roman government wanted to get everybody in certain places so that they would know who the people were in order for a taxation to properly take place. And so it's a registration, but they lived up there in Nazareth. And again, Nazareth's up in northern Israel in Galilee, so they're going to have to come all the way down the Jordan Valley, close to Jerusalem, and then cut down to Bethlehem. Why do they go to Bethlehem? And the answer is, Yeah, he, he descended from David. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways you can answer that. You may have wanted to write down, because Joseph was of the house and the lineage of David. That's a good way to answer it. Or he descended from David. Uh, say that again. That's exactly right. So he was of the house of David, descended from David, and what do we know about David? Where was David from? David was from Bethlehem. Uh, isn't that a beautiful story when you think about what God was doing to work through people to bring about the Messiah? You know, you go back generation, a couple generations before David, you've got the whole Boaz and Ruth story. By the way, you know that before he got married, Boaz was really ruthless. <laughs> so you, you've got the, the Boaz and Ruth story, uh, you know, coming down the line to David's father, Jesse, and then ultimately to David. So yeah, they had to go back to Bethlehem because politically speaking, that was Augustus's plan, that all the people in all the empire would go back to their original hometowns. And can, can you imagine how problematic that was? I mean, that was very problematic in the first century to have to travel all that distance. I mean, you can look at the maps in your Bible, but again, Nazareth being up in the northern part of the country, coming all the way down to Bethlehem, and being nine months pregnant all the while, that was a big deal. But it had to be done. It had, how many miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem? Uh, these days, it would be right around 100 miles. Yeah, even now. Even now, it would be close to 100 miles. Uh, it would have been further then because you didn't have the highways, obviously, that they have now. But it was a, it was a big deal. Uh, but not only is there a political component here, but there is a biblical component because what did Micah prophesy? In Bethlehem. Bethlehem, Ephratah, too little to be counted among the clan of Judah but in you shall come forth one for me. And that one, of course, would be the Messiah. So that's why, politically speaking, biblically speaking, to fulfill a prophecy. Luke 2, 4, Jesus, uh, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David. Number nine, how did Mary and Joseph travel to Bethlehem? How did they travel to Bethlehem? Have any of you ever heard, it's not real popular in our culture, but have you ever heard the old English carol, The Friendly Beasts? 
You ever heard, anybody ever heard that? The friendly beasts? Um, look it up. It's, it's, it's a fascinating little carol written primarily for kids, but it's, it's beautiful, has a wonderful melody. And there's one particular stanza of that carol that tries to answer this question. And it's what we think of, you know, when we think of Mary and Joseph making the journey down to Bethlehem. It's sort of the first thing we think of. But how did they do it? How did they travel to Bethlehem? Who's got the answer? Well, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. The, I heard the, the obvious answer. Of course it was on a donkey. Back to the friendly beasts, the last stanza says, I said the donkey, shaggy and brown. I carried his mother to Bethlehem town. I carried her safely. And I don't remember the rest of the words, but it ends by saying, I said the donkey, shaggy and brown. So that's what we have in our minds. But the fact is, we, we don't know if a donkey was available. Mary being nine months pregnant, she probably would have ridden on a donkey. Um, you know, Joseph may have guided it, that kind of, maybe they had two donkeys. But the fact is, we don't know. All we know is what Scripture says in Luke 2, 4. Joseph also, same Scripture we looked at a moment ago, went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. They just went. Um, if they had a donkey, that would have been a good thing, but we don't know that. All right, y'all are mad at me now, aren't you? Number 10. Was the innkeeper mean to Mary and Joseph? Was the innkeeper mean to Mary and Joseph? Was he a mean man? All right. I think you're looking up. What do you think? Was the innkeeper mean? No. No. Not necessarily. <laughs> it's what I would say. But we don't know. We don't know because all Scripture says in Luke 2, 7 is there was no room for them in the inn. But I will say this. You know, if in a little play or in a movie or whatever the innkeeper is portrayed as an angry, mean man trying to keep out Jesus, that, that's really taking it too far. And, and a lot of um, scholars would actually say that he provided for them a better place because, let me tell you something, it was not the Drury Inn, all right? It wasn't Holiday Inn Express, it wasn't, anything close to what you and I would think of as staying in a hotel somewhere. Uh, it would have been a, a very difficult place, especially with the registration going on and everybody having to be in Bethlehem that was of the house and lineage of David. It would have been a zoo there. It would have been um, a very unpleasant experience. And so it could be that the innkeeper, however he got involved, it could be that he did a very kind thing for them. So, you know, I've ruined it for you again. Next time you see one of those plays or the movie or hear a Bible teacher or a preacher, I mean, I, I have heard full-blown sermons on no room for Jesus. And um, while it's true there's a lot of people that have no room for Jesus, it would be a stretch to say that the innkeeper uh, was, was mean about it and, and cast out Mary and Joseph and Jesus. He, he may have really provided the best place for them they could have been. But the other thing that we know is that it was, it was all God's plan, right? 
because there is theological significance to Jesus being born where He was born, not just the city of David, not just Bethlehem, but having a very humble birth, you know, a birth that's not fit for a king, right? But a birth that presents Jesus the way God wanted His Son presented, uh, humble, accessible. You know, if shepherds can go and worship the coming of the Messiah and worship Jesus there, if shepherds had access to Him, then what does that say about everybody else? We all have access to Jesus. I want to go back and spend just another five minutes or so with Matthew 1, 21 and talk to you about the name of Jesus. I think it's important during the Christmas season to recall why God through the angel told Joseph to give Jesus this name and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Let me ask you, when you hear the name Jesus, just give me in just a word or two or maybe three a simple thought that comes to your mind just when you hear the name Jesus. Savior, yes. Any other thought? The thought of peace, yes. Mercy. Yeah, all those wonderful things are certainly connected to the name Jesus. We know it's a powerful name. The Bible says it's the only name given among men by which we can be what, church? Saved. But what does the name Jesus mean? You probably know this, but it's helpful for us to Refresh it. So the name Jesus literally means Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. Or another way to translate it is Yahweh is salvation. Now, what's that word Yahweh? What is that word? Yes, the Old Testament personal name for God. Um, We'll say a little more about this in a moment, but let me go ahead and quickly introduce it. When Moses was on the mountain and you have the burning bush experience and God calls Moses from that burning bush to go back to Egypt, Moses asks him, who do I tell them has sent me? Who is this? Who are you? And God says, Yahweh, that is the Old Testament untranslated. By the way, the, the English word Jehovah is an anglicized translation of Yahweh, but the honest Hebrew word, the honest Hebrew name for God is Yahweh. I'll give you this too very, very quickly. When you read the Old Testament, you will find uh, three names used for who we consider to be Father God. So when you see the word God, G-O-D, capitalized in the Old Testament and English translations, that is Elohim. That is the great, transcendent, eternal, self-sustaining God. That's Elohim. When you see the word Lord... L with small letters, O-R-D, capital L, but uh, small letters, O-R-D, Lord, uh, that's Adonai. So that is uh, Master. So Elohim is self-sustaining, transcendent God, Lord, Master. But when you read your Old Testament and you find the word Lord in all capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The Hebrew word there is Yahweh, which is that, again, personal 
name for God. Another way to translate it would be, I am that I am. That's what Jesus picks up on in the book of John when he makes those I am statements. But the, the name Jesus itself means Yahweh saves or Yahweh is our salvation. The Hebrew way to say it is Yeshua. Everybody say that with me. You'll learn a little Hebrew tonight. Here we go. Yeshua. So that's the Hebrew word. And it's a compound name, Yah and Yasha. So the words Yah and the word Yasha come together to form Yeshua. Yah is just the abbreviation for the word we looked at a moment ago, Yahweh. So when you look at Yeshua, the, the first part of it comes from Yah. Again, Exodus 3.14, I am that I am, Yahweh. And Yasha in the Hebrew language means to rescue, to deliver, or as we like to say in a Baptist church, to save. So when you put that together, Yah Yasha, that's Yeshua, Yeshua, which again means God is our Savior. In the Old Testament, when you see that word translated into English, anglicized, you get the word Joshua. So did you know that Jesus and Joshua literally have the same name? So Joshua in the Old Testament is Yeshua, and then in the Greek, and this, this I hope will all kind of come together for you here, Yeshua translated into the Greek language is Jesus, which sounds a whole lot more like what? Jesus. And then when we take the Greek word Jesus, which is the translation of Yeshua in English, that's where we get the word Jesus. So again, Yahweh saves, the Lord is salvation. So no wonder that bringing the message from God to Joseph, God says, I want you to name my son Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Let me say this very quickly and briefly. I, I could keep you here a lot longer, but I won't. Um, in all of the defining moments where Jesus, His name is introduced, where His mission statement is given in the New Testament, and all those big defining moments, you see it clearly over and over again that Jesus came to save. So, beginning at His birth, name Him Jesus, Yeshua, because He will save His people from their sins. When Jesus was introducing His public ministry, and He's coming down to the bank of the Jordan where John the Baptist is baptizing, that's how He introduced and started His public ministry, what did John say about Jesus when He saw Him coming down the hillside? Do you remember? That's right. That's exactly what John the Baptist says. He looks up and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away what? The sins of the world. Then when Jesus defined his ministry, what did he say about himself? He said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And then right before His ascension, in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 and following, you know, when the disciples are wanting Jesus to talk about releasing them from the Romans, Jesus redirected them and told them it wasn't for them to know the things that God had planned in that regard, but to be on mission for Him. He said, you will receive the Holy Spirit, and when He comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. And He told them to do what? To start in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, 
and then ultimately all over the world. In other words, get out the message that Jesus saves. So you can't miss it. Name him Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. And as my followers go out and take the message to the lost world that there is a Jesus who died on a cross, who resurrected from the grave, who has ascended back to the right hand of the Father and one day is coming again. Go tell. Go tell. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. That's a good song, isn't it? Because that's our marching orders to go tell. So here's what you need to know. The name Jesus was a popular name in first century Israel. There were a lot of kids that were named Jesus, Yeshua, because who's one of their Old Testament heroes? This guy we call Joshua. And so there were a lot that were named Jesus. And for that reason, in the Gospels, often you hear his location attached to it, where he grew up. Jesus of Nazareth. And that's what differentiated Jesus from a lot of the other first century Jesuses in that area. But his personal name, Jesus... You know, it's a beautiful continuation of the salvation narrative that God started all the way back in the Old Testament because what was Joshua doing? What was Yeshua, Joshua, doing in the Old Testament? He was taking the people to the promised land. Moses had moved off the scene and he was there to take them to the land that God had given And he did that. He did it successfully. They took over the promised land because God had gone before them and with them. Yeshua in the Old Testament takes them to a promised land, but the better Yeshua, the Yeshua, the Jesus of the New Testament, what does he do for God's people? He too is a deliverer, the ultimate deliverer deliverer who delivers us to the promises that God has made to us as a part of the new covenant. Beautiful name, isn't it? No other name like it, the name of Jesus. I hope you had a little fun with me tonight. I hope you learned a little something and that Christmas is maybe a little more meaningful to you after we've had this time together. Um, let's turn our attention to the prayer list. We've got a couple minutes before it's time to dismiss. And there may be a name. I, I recognize one very quickly. Brother Tommy Hodges uh, did pass away. And uh, I think so.